Blessed Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome as we take a look at our first reading um, this past Easter Sunday. Um, over Easter, we have a tendency to read from the book of Acts as the, the ongoing history into the New Testament, um, into the church, the church post-death post and resurrection of Jesus, um, as a way to, to continue not only the Old Testament history, but to point out the fulfillment of all of those things that, that have been promised. And so we've been hearing about all of these messianic prophecies, the prophecies about who this Christ would be, um, right, right into, since the beginning of Advent, where... God promised to send a savior and his name would be called Emmanuel, the descendant of David and all of those sorts of things along the way. And <clears throat> today we turn to our, our reading from this past Sunday, Acts 10, beginning at verse um, 34, where um, we jump a little bit, a little bit, and have to say it is a little, little bit, because um, not only is it post-Pentecost, this reading, but but as a part of, of the readings in the book of Acts, where we'll dig into this in just a minute. But as Peter preaches, together with, you know, all of, the, all of us who are hearing in and the way that Luke records this, he points out not only that, you know, this gift of salvation of what Christ has done by his dying and rising is not just something for Jewish people only, um, for Israelites, but it extends to all people. And this becomes one of those messages that we, we need to hold on to within our own context in our world, because... Um, so often people want to push Christianity by the wayside and say it's just for those people over there, but we can do our own thing. No, Jesus is the Savior for all people. And that beca became not only part of that early church preaching, but it's, it's still just as much true for our world today where, you know, um, it, we, we are still called to be witnesses to all people, regardless of what country they've come from, what color their skin is. Um, what moral issues they wrestle with, um, and those sorts of things along the way. Because, um, you know, it's it's through the same Savior that everyone has that access to, to heaven. And as we hear this, and as we struggle and grapple in our, our North American, Canadian context here, here in Winnipeg with, with trying to figure out what our mission is, um, considering how so many people seem to just want to fall away, um, it's still the same. It's still the same, to preach repentance and forgiveness in the name of Jesus to people of every nation, every language, of every tribe, um, so that through that message, the Holy Spirit can draw them into that new life in Christ. So as we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that in the resurrection of your Son, you provided a way not only for your chosen people of the Old Testament, but for all people to have that same access by the same blood and by the same gift of a Savior to that eternal eternal life. Bless us in our own day so that um, even, even in the way in which our world and society prefers to try and push push us back to, to be you know, silent or cut off from the rest of the world, that we would have the boldness to serve, even in small ways, so that people come not only to see, but then also to hear that message of, of Jesus as the Savior who has conquered not only sin and death, but even the, the temptations of the wily old devil, so that in all things that we would be able to not only build together as people from every nation, language, and tribe, but to be able to stand together and sing together and pray together as, as one new family in Christ. Guide us so that our eyes would ever be focused on those things that are above the way that Paul wrote in our epistle reading, all for that wonderful gift for which we praise you in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Acts 10. Acts is an interesting book because um, it's written by Luke, the same fellow that wrote, wrote the Gospel of Luke. And Luke um, wrote those as two, two parts to the same story for a fellow by the name of Theophilus. And here's the whole question. Is Theophilus just a general name for someone who, where the word literally means in, in the Greek language, the one who loves God or is a friend of God? Um, or was it written um, as, as something for um, a specific person who happened to have the name Theophilus? Because that was 
is a very much a possible name during that time. And there's probably a bit of both that's attached to it. But um, Luke tells the story, and Luke is particularly interested in, in telling the account for a Greek-speaking audience, both from the life of Christ, but then also from the life of the early church, so that as people you know, wrestled and grappled with, you know, what is this Christianity thing, especially from a Greek context, that um, they were able to not only hear and see that, that Jesus came as the Savior, not only and specifically for people who were from a Jewish-Israelite background, but as, as for the Greeks as well. And um, as a result, when we read through this, Luke um, becomes a very important um, evangelist and evangelical writer within the New Testament, so that um, he, he points out for, for a Greek audience, a non-Jewish audience, who this Jesus is, um, to, to emphasize that, you know, this Jesus is for you too. Um, each of the gospel writers has a different audience in mind, and that's why they, they write in slightly different ways, not only because they're different, different people. Matthew is written largely for an Israelite um, kind of a community. Mark, likely for a Roman audience, which is why, you know, the Romans were known for their efficiency, and so Jesus always seems to be in a hurry, and immediately Jesus did this, and then he did that, and then he did that. Luke, for a Greek audience, and then John, um, he wrote later in life, and so um, the way he writes is actually just absolutely brilliant, where he combines not only um, Greek philosophical categories with, with biblical Old Testament um, Hebrew categories. But he writes this in a way that, that captures both um, both the, the, the church being the last of the Gospels, where they're starting to, to meld together across these different cultures. This cross-cultural thing is not anything new for us in our world today. And as we hear it, um, it becomes this important um, message even for our own day and age, where the the early church, using the modern term, wrestled with various forms of racism, okay, prejudice, where the Israelites didn't particularly like the Greeks coming in, or the Romans, and then the Greeks and the Romans, they had troubles with anyone else who was from another language or tribe, because they simply referred to them as barbarians, because they didn't speak that civilized language of, of Greek or, or of Latin, you know, and those sorts of things along the way. But the way that um, not only Luke builds on the way that Jesus, he said, stay in Jerusalem until you will be clothed with power from on high after his resurrection at the point of his ascension, where, you know, they're waiting and the Holy Spirit descends and then they preach the gospel to all of these Jewish pilgrims that are in Jerusalem and they hear the gospel message. But um, Acts is built around the movement from Jerusalem to Samaria, okay, and these are familiar words, you know, wait until you're clothed with power from on high and then go and proclaim the gospel in Jerusalem, Samaria, and then to all the ends of the earth. Um, meaning that it starts starts where the holy city is, but then it extends where the Jews, well, Jews and Samaritans did not get along, but the gospel was for them too, the Samaritan gospel. And then here, chapter 10 is basically Peter after he's called over to the house of a fellow, a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. And, and basically this fellow is not Jewish, he is not Samaritan, he is a Gentile. And the understanding is, is that yes, indeed, the Holy Spirit sends out the church to be a preacher of the gospel to people from all nations so that all nations are joined together in that one salvation that Jesus Christ himself, that one and only begotten Son, eternally begotten Son of God, provides for us. For us and for our world today, that is so important for us to remember because we have a tendency to get caught up on our way of doing things where, and then we either play around and fudge the message in order to fit into different cultural contexts, or we turn ourselves into this kind of a thing where it doesn't really matter and that God can be God, different God for different people. And the answer is no. Same God, same Savior. Yes, we speak different languages. We may sing differently. We may cook differently. We may, you know, worship differently. Some dance and some don't. It doesn't make worship more more real or more alive. But as we hear this, it's the one same message and one same Savior that binds us together all in the waters of our baptism.
That's where Paul writes, there's neither Jew or Greek. And then he goes on and includes the barbarians in some of his talk as well. You know, barbarians, bar, 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 where he makes fun of, you know, the way in which we, we try to divide things up when Christ has brought us together, where Christ is our peace. So again, beginning of chapter 10, verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. What does he mean? Okay. So he doesn't take a look at your culture, your skin color, the language you speak. But in every nation, anyone who fears him, so that word of faith, and does what is right is acceptable to him. So this isn't a matter of saying that, you know, salvation is found in all kinds of different religious practices as long as you're do-gooders. But it's this, this very real sense where it begins with that, that faith who fears him. Okay. So there's that sense where there is a very real God, a very real message, a very real revealed sense of who God is, and that this is all brought together in from people from all nations. Isaiah is filled chock full and the prophets are filled chock full with that same message where, you know, the time will come where, you know, that Savior, that promised Messiah will come in and people from every nation will worship God in his holy temple. Okay, from every nation. Okay, and this is the extension and the unfolding of that. So as the word of um, so as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now notice where he goes. So he doesn't just say God in a generic sense, but instead, this is the one who came, Jesus, who went not only through preaching throughout Israel, but he preaches this good news of peace reconciliation. Okay, if you want to call it that, through Jesus Christ. So.
the church have stumbled on this, and I have to admit that. The most inclusive of religious philosophies is the Christian faith, where Jesus doesn't exclude people based on their skin color, their language, or where they come from, but instead welcomes everybody through that same door of forgiveness, to preach repentance and forgiveness in his name. And that's such a beautiful message that, you know, as we take a look at our work, our ongoing missionary work, even in 2023, as Easter, Good Friday, Easter, death and resurrection people, that we have that same beautiful message for a world that wrestles and struggles with how and where do we belong. In Christ, we all belong to him in whose name we have that perfect forgiveness. Let's live that with one another as well. Amen.